welcome to Thinking Tackle. What a way to start. Mr. Wild Boar, the Swedish Wild Boar, because of that <laughs> bit on top of there. Um, he's going to be showing us how to get loads of bites on places like this. Ron Braze knows one in Oxford on the Linear Complex, and this place has got literally thousands of carp in it. They're a bit spawny at the moment, so they're not easy to catch, but the ones that are out there that are feeding are obviously uh, getting onto Jake's bait. He's had one already this morning, which we've got down there in the sling, which came just a few minutes ago, and the middle rod just roared off, and we've got another abig. Um, this one looks about mid, mid double. Mid double, so a typical but, fish for Bray's nose. There he is. There he is, right. Let's play oh, Gilly. Guide him around that sling. Guide him around the sling <laughs> that's already in the water, yeah. <laughs> Get in the net. Beautiful. There we have it. Good man. Well done, Jacob. Thank you very much. So, what we're basically going to do once we've got these two fish out, weighed them and photographed them and everything. We're going to go through all the tactics you need to use on these sort of waters because it's big hit fishing. Hopefully we're going to get loads of bites. The baits are very small, the feed's very important. So once we get the fish out, we're going to get on with all those tactics. Right, hold on a second there, wild boar, before because I, I can see we've got two rods out already. Yep. And a third to go. Yet we've still got fish in the net. Yep. Languishing, and then another one in the sling. So, why have you got all this sorted out before um, you've done that? It's one thing I've done in here for a number of years. Basically, the fish in here move around in big shoals. Yep. So, I've how already, big is big? Um, you know, pushing hundred. Really? So, right, okay. you know, these are hungry fish basically. Yep. And what I've seen this morning, the people around me have all caught. Right. So, gentlemen over the way had one, one to the right had one, and they were like, you know, getting the fish out, doing their pictures and stuff, and then the shoal moved on to me. Now, the first thing I did, got the fish in the net, grabbed my spod rod and put three spots over the top. Okay. So, rather than getting the fish out, you know, doing the pictures, there's Which, ten, if you timed it, could it, take it takes It takes a long a time, yeah, yeah, you know, half an hour, pushing an hour sometimes if you're flapping about doing your rods. So, basically, making sure every time that the fish are safe, obviously. So, yep. don't, don't have them you know, resting on the side in shallow water or tangled up in some weed, just as long as they're all right, yep. you know, you can get your rod sorted and back out there because once that shoal's there, you want to keep them there. Right, so the know. three spots that have gone out yep. have gone out to keep the fish feeding. Yep. The rods that got messed up, they've gone back out against Straight the clip, back out. dropped yep. back on the spot again. Yep. Your third, well, you've got four rods going, haven't you? Yeah, that's you've it. Got I one always, hooked up. Yep. And then this one ready to go. So right. how I normally fish it when I can, is got my rods fishing, yep. another rod ready to go, baited, Right. fish in the net, spod, so keep them interested with the food, don't yep. put a lead straight on top of them, Right. then put my baited rig out there, Right. then a couple of spods over the top again, Right. and then deal with the fish. And then do the fish. So yep. you've got four rods going, four uh, rods going one ready to go time. all the time. Yeah. Right, yep. I can see I'm going to have to fish very hard to keep up with you <laughs> over the next couple of days. Right, we'll get that one out there and, and then we'll get the fish done. I'll yep. give you a bit of a wider berth. No problem. So this was the first one, mate, yeah? This was the first indeed, so first one's always the best, isn't it? Absolutely. And how big? Uh, 23 on the nose. Nice. And a very dark fish. What they've done here is they put dye in the water and that stops the light getting down to the bottom and stops the weed growing so much, so it makes the place easier to fish. And the result on the fish themselves is they go nice and dark like this, so a top result. And the other one was probably a mid-double, would you yeah, say? Yeah, mid-double comes straight afterwards, pretty much, so. Wicked. Wicked, okay. Well, Jake's going to get this one back, and then I'm going to have a cast round in my swim with the marker rod and try and map mine out. And then uh, obviously, we're going to talk to him about rigs later on in the show. Right, there's been a change of plan. Basically, in the last hour or so, the wind has changed direction. It's absolutely hacking down the other end. And even though I have caught a few this morning, you know, it's obvious that the fish aren't here now. So basically, I got down to my rods. I had a walk down there, and it's clear that they're all down there. So basically, get the rods in, get everything packed up, and get over there. Well, that is kids for you. Uh, he's not happy being here. He wants to move down the other end. I've had a look myself down there and there are a hell of a lot of fish down there. 
I didn't actually get a chance to cast out in this swim, um, but that's the way it goes. You know, you've got to go with local knowledge. You've got to put the effort in on these sort of places. If the majority of the fish are down there, that's where we've got to be. So we're going to pack up and recamp down the other end. What's going there, Jacob? What's that? Is this caught on this one, is it? Yeah. You sure? I think so. It went it went right to left. Yeah, yeah it's on it. Yeah, because the zig's obviously there, he went. <laughs> yeah, I'll just keep this line nice and slack. Yeah. Yeah. It's important when you've got one fish that's picked up another line, well basically he's picked up his zig rod because he's got a zig rig very close in as well. And uh, it's going this fish, isn't it? It is going, he's finally woken up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's important just to open the bail arm. If you're on your own, just put it on the rest with the bail arm open and just worry about it when you get the fish in. If you keep the line tight on this rod, it will can very easily slide down the other line and end up pulling the hook out or even snaring the fish up in some weed and then you lose everything. So just by keeping this open like this, Hopefully it won't have mangled the line up too much at the other end and, uh, and Jake will get this in. You're not saying a lot. No, because I don't like this of a line <laughs> around it. <laughs> What's going on? Is it weed you up? Yeah. Right, there she goes. Just keep moving. Line whistling in the wind. Has that come on a solid bag? Yeah. So Which... you'd fish them, you know, it's not just out there, you'd underarm them. Yeah, well, there's, I'll, well, I'll put them where the fish are. Right, That's, okay. You know, that is the most important thing. At the end of the day, we were sat over there and it just didn't feel right. Mm. And I, I know for a fact that if we sat there now, we might have, you know, had the odd bite, but we've come around here and it's took, what, minutes? Yeah. To get one, yeah. you know? And if you look about the place, these swims were free and everyone is just still sat there. <laughs> you know, if there's a swim free and the wind's blowing and there's fish there, be quick. Yeah, get round <laughs> you know? there, yeah. I've learned from fishing these waters for years. You know, if you if you wait around five, 10 minutes, that swim could have gone. Right. That, you know, it's that quick. The amount of times I used to come down here and find the fish and then someone beat you to it, so then you've got to, you know, be quick. And it can make all the difference. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot of fish here, mate, and there? yeah. there's a fish showing, you can see fish under the surface. I thought your bite had come on, this, on the zig rod. Yeah, I did. I went when I had the bobbin, I thought, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've well, got it. <laughs> I'll put this down and just uh, play gilly again. That's <laughs> <laughs> lassoed in. All right. <laughs> Coming in backwards. Get in. Got him. <laughs> It was a bit hairy, well, that wasn't was, it? That was different. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we have it, proof in the pudding that keeping mobile is absolutely critical on day ticket waters. You know, it just goes to show five minutes in the right spot. It's much better than a day sat there catching nothing. So, caught on a simple, solid bag presentation. I'm going to slip him back and run for exactly how I tie it up. We're getting all technical now, and uh, I have to say, Mr. Wildboar, that is a thing of beauty. Um, I can never get them as tight as that, and I'm sure there's a lot of people watching this who feel exactly the same way. So the first thing I want to pick your brains on is how do you get them that tight? What is the mix on the inside of the bag, and what size bag? Because I've noticed when you're casting, I always associate solid bags with badoosh, yeah, yeah. and they don't make that sound, do no, they? No, they don't, they don't at so all. So what size bag is that? Um, that is an extra small. Right, okay. Purely because if you put that in the edge and it breaks down, yep. that actually creates quite a big bed right. or quite a big spread of bait. Right, okay. You know, so what I want from this is the fish to come down, see it, be greedy and think I'm having the lot, right. take it in, 
and then with the hook bait being light, we'll hopefully fly in and catch hold. Bang, you've so got it. So if you've got a big bag, they get too preoccupied around the rig, and then they're starting, then it gives them time to suss out what's going on. Right, so basically, a mouthful of food. A mouthful, yeah. yeah it must be easier to cast when it's exactly, smaller Exactly, you well. know, we're on a big lake here, so if the fish are in the middle, that can get out there as well. Right, so what sort of distance can you cast that to? Um, depending on the wind, you can fish them, you know, 150 yards. If really? You've got, if you've got the right <laughs> lead in there, because right. the thing is with that, if the wind's off the back of you, it's just like a little bullet. Right. Put it in the air and it'll just go. Okay. So, right, so the mix inside, I can see you've got loads of little tiny particles and a yep. few bigger bits. What's in there? Um, it's basically just a mixture of size of pellets, so you've got the breakdown of it all, but the most importantly, is different sizes is to get into all the little nuts and crannies. Right. So if you add just say four mil pellets, yep. you get loads of little gaps and you won't get it as tight as that. Right. So it's it, the it's the different sizes and the the, the finest it, one which is like a salmon fry crumb, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is indeed. So that right. gets in all the little gaps, which right. makes and it that's as hard how it as goes possible. as hard as that. Right. So talk us through from dropping the rig in to getting it that tight. Yep, so to start with you open it up, put a small bit of pellet in to start with. Right, and I've noticed you're using a little scoop to, yep, to scoop yep, it in with. Does that make it, it easier? In. It does, yeah, because right. otherwise, you know, you're trying to get on top right. of it and everything okay. else. So put the hook bait in the corner. Right, and you, I can see from your fingers there, you're opening the top of the bag yeah, up. So yeah, so you're opening it up and then you're pushing it in. And the beauty of it is you can lay it how you want it. Right. So don't just chuck it in, throw some bait on it and right. you know, hope for the best. You can lay it in, so the hook bait in the corner. Yep. And then put a little bit of pellet in. And then I actually put the leading early. Right but then put pellet in little and often. Right. And then grab the line and shimmy the lead up. Right. So what that would do is just weave in the pellets. Right. And then keep doing little and often and little and often and always patting it down. Right. So there is a bit of a finesse to it. Obviously I'm very sad and tired of hundreds <laughs> of these, which is why it's like Well, that. they catch fish, mate, don't they? Yeah, they, they do, you know? they do. So constantly keep adding little bits and you know, don't be afraid, as long as they're not damp, you can really, you know, really pat them pack down. The yeah, in. don't right. don't just half-heartedly. Right. Into okay. It. Get it nice and tight. Right. And then fill it all the way up, not too much. Obviously, give yourself enough gap to twist it. I right. Mean, okay. With the twisting part, a lot of people, and I know Ali prefers to lick it and stuff, but I've always tied mine off. Right. So you tie them with PVA tape. Tie them with PVA so tape. So you yeah. twisting it up really tight. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as when you're twisting it. As soon as you let that go, it's going to be loose again. Right, so how so do you stop it from unravelling then? Just ravelling it and then get in the right position within your hand yep. to hold it. And then whilst you're pinching it, get the PVA tape and tightly wrap that round. Right, okay. And then hold the two bits and then it's not going to come undone. And then you tie then that tie in a knot. A couple of granny knots, pull it down. Right. Nice and tight and then trim it down. Then obviously making sure you don't cut that. I've right. done that a few times when you're rushing <laughs> and you just go yeah. and then you've got to start again. So you've so. You're a bit on the end, you've trimmed all the excess off yeah. of there yeah. and that's giving it that lovely sort of bullet shape and I'm guessing you've, you've st stuck them down at the yeah, front. Yeah, that's you? it and then you, you've kind of pushed the corners in because you can even compact it even more. Right. And then lick with fingers, lick the bottom, fold it over, same again the other side so you make it nice and aerodynamic and then all these little, little like, extras yep. make a big difference yes you know if that's all you know floppy and everything when it hits the water you think that thing's hitting the water at some you know some speed. serious speed so it yeah. goes bang goes all the way down then hits the bottom right you know if it's all floppy it won't go down you know yep. i can feel the lead down with that right you know because it's so is, compact so, you can feel it donk, yeah. donk down yeah. and i notice on there quick change on there you've got a very very short lead core leader yep. with a loop on the end. So you're just looping yep. to loop I'm this loop, on. I'm loop to looping them on. Like right. It's all about speed for me, especially in places like this. Once the fish are on you, right. it's all about getting the rod back out there. So okay. having them tied up like that, you can literally just loop to loop, you're ready to go. Because when you get a fish in the net, you're all excited, you've got wet hands and trying to tie them up. <laughs> yeah, and you're not, I get you know. it. So if, it. And especially if it's raining and stuff like that, you can have them all prepared and you're fishing, you know, especially on here, like what we've done, we've moved round. You've got fishing the sun here, done. I'm fishing within seconds right. and I've caught with him, you know, yeah. pretty much straight away. So right. I know I'm fishing effectively and very quickly. Okay. So that is the guide to solid PVA bag fishing from the master himself. Later on in the show, we're going to talk about the bits inside there because that's just as important.
been in the swim a few hours now, and although Jake's had a couple of chances on his solid bags next door to me, nothing's happened in front of me. The fish have sort of moved away a little bit now. We're not seeing so many in the edge, so we're going to put some bait in. So we're going to go through the mix, and in this show, we're not using any boilies at all. It's all particle. It's a much cheaper way of fishing, and for these kind of lakes with loads of fishing, it's deadly effective. So we're going to start off with good old-fashioned sweet corn. Yep, cheap stuff you get in a supermarket. Four tins of that goes in straight off and you can fish over here with just corn. The fish absolutely love this stuff and I've seen people spotting just corn and doing brilliantly. And the best way to buy it if you're going to do that is the kilo bags in the supermarket that are in the freezer. Once they're thawed out they taste exactly the same. So we've got four tins of corn in there and then good old fashioned hemp. Carp absolutely love this and if you have a little taste of this There's probably mums in their front rooms being sick now, but that tastes absolutely lovely. Really nutty and gorgeous. So, a couple more of them in there. And then, one of the all-time best carp baits ever. It's tiger nuts. A few of those in there as well. These have started to go gloopy already. You can, I don't know if you can see as I pour that in, it's starting to go gloopy. Tiger nuts in this heat will go off after probably four or five days, the hemp the same. So what we're doing now is using stuff that Jake has already boiled up in advance now, and then we've got jars of stuff in the back of the van, so when we run out, we can swap over to that. And then finally, some pellets. Not loads of pellets, and these serve a couple of purposes. One, fish absolutely love them, and a lot of the fish that are in here are actually reared on them. Two, it helps everything stay in the back of the spod. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, when the fish feed on these, you get a slick come up to the surface and we know we're going to get a bite. So it indicates that the fish are out there. So just a couple of those in there and give it a good old mix around. And that basically is it. What a lovely carpy mix that is. And after probably about 15, 20 minutes, those pellets are going to take on the water from the hemp. They're going to swell up a little bit, and it's going to help me push it down in the back of the spod so that none comes out on the cast and it all drops over the bait. So that's what's going out there. Let's see how we do it. To spod accurately and at long distance, you need the right kit. First of all, let's talk about the spod. Very, very lightweight a very buoyant, very visible nose cone, so it comes up to the surface really quickly. If there's a crosswind out there and it doesn't come up quick enough, it will drag it along in the crosswind and spread your bait out too much. You can see there are big holes in the side of the spod, so it clears really easily. Big flights on the back to keep it up in the air, and then fairly stiff tails on the back of it. That helps you get the back out of the water quickly when you're winding in, so it comes along the surface as easily as possible. And then let's talk about the rod and reel. I've got braided reel line on there, so that's super, super thin. 20 pound braid that I've got on there is the same thickness as four pound mono. So you can imagine how easily it flies off the spool. On the end of that is a leader. It's a 30 pound braided leader. So that takes the force of the cast and then the light stuff comes off and that's why it sails so far. If you've not done any spotting before, I'd recommend you don't use the leader. Just go for 30 pound braid straight through and then you won't get any problems with it frapping up around the rings and also you haven't got anything to tie on. But if you're into spotting, a 30 pound leader is the way to go. And then the rod itself, you can see a very stiff rod there. If I pull back on that, it's a proper spod rod. A lot of people try and spod with their fourth rod that they don't really use anymore. It's got too many rings on it. It's not stiff enough and it just won't go out there. So this is a dedicated spod rod. Big rings you can see there, a 50 mil butt ring going down to a 16 mil tip. So that line just flies off and also a long handle. That's really important. A long handle means you can move the tip of the rod through the air easier and it just makes the whole job so much simpler. So that's the kit. Let's put one down into the bucket. I'm already clipped up at the right range. I just washed my hand off. So I'm already clipped up at the right range. It takes everybody a few to get their eye in. So uh, let's put the first one out there. See how we go. So my arms are extended up away from my body. Out she goes. And that's not bad. To be honest, I've done a couple already just to get my eye in. So uh, when there's a little bit of a crosswind like this, you have to cast the spot into the crosswind and uh, just let it fade over towards the float. And that's probably landed three foot away. If I got that far away either side of the float, I'd be really happy with that. Every now and again, you get one to go a little bit wayward, but it doesn't matter. And 
just that bit of time talking to you has allowed the spot to empty. That's something you see a lot of people do wrong. As soon as it's hit the surface, they're winding it back in again. And all you're doing is flushing all the stuff out the spot along your lines back from the spot. So that's had more than enough time now. Flick it up to the surface, get the back end of it out of the water. There we go. And then don't fight with it, just a steady pace winding in and just skip the spod across the surface. And if it's very hard to wind in, there's probably stuff left in it. So you need to flick it on the surface a bit more before you wind it in. I'll show you one more car, straight up to my hand, into the bucket. Just press it down with my fingers so it's all in the nose of the spod. Wash my hand off so the reel doesn't, get end, doesn't end up getting covered in it. And then arms nice and extended up. hit the clip now that one's probably a rod length away which is shockingly bad to be honest I'd like to be dropping them probably three or four feet away at the most and concentrating all the bait in one area that concentrates the fish as well and that's how you build a big hit but with spotting like everything practice makes perfect so start at 50 yards get that bang on then go a bit further then go a bit further and uh, as long as you fish within your capabilities you'll fish well if there's spots going everywhere and they're dropping short with a float, you're just spreading the fish out and you'll probably catch nothing. So uh, practice makes perfect. Okay, so we're on the second day now, and I've uh, been up since first light and haven't seen anything at all. I've tried absolutely everything, you know, spotting over zigs, fishing in the edge, bags, you know, and with the wind pushing in, it does look really good and uh, a bit head banging really to see, not work out what's going on. So basically, same as yesterday, I'm going to chuck my stuff on the barra, go and have a walk about, and hopefully try and find them. As you can see, it's another absolute scorcher. Jake and I didn't fish last night. We both baited our areas, 20 wraps, so 80 yards. That's where Jake said we get bites from this morning, but it just didn't happen. Don't know why, a little bit of a slick come up off my bait. I had three rods really close together, but no takes came. So a little while ago, I wound one rod in, put it nice and close out there with a few spots over the top. I've just wound the second rod in, and that's gonna go down this margin, because it's the only place I'm seeing fish. Out in the lake, normally, they'd be showing themselves all the time, but we're just not seeing them. Jake's been spotting over zigs. That hasn't paid off either. If he'd have got a bite like that, I would have swapped all my rods over to the same thing. But I know he's gonna have a walk around now and try and find some fish. I have got a few here, so I'm just gonna put a little tiny bit of trickery out there just a stick and a white hook bait on a very short hook link just over the top of the marginal weed and see if I can snare one here. Out she goes, slow it down, lovely. Just feel the lead at the bottom. Donk. Okay. Between the two of us, we can do no more. Right, okay, so you join me on the opposite side of the lake to where we've been fishing. It's off the back of the wind at the moment now. Yesterday, the wind was hacking down there, the fish were on it. For, for whatever reason today, they're not. So I've come down here, this predominantly is the shallower end, and already within five minutes I've seen a few fish show. So I'm going to put some rods out there and hopefully snare one. Well, here we are. The rod's literally been out for about five minutes, and it's away. About took my rod in, I about slipped in as well what it's all about but what a result it just goes to show yet again that sat there behind stationary rods isn't the one you know when times are hard and you're not catching think about what's happening go and have a walk about if you can and try and find those fish because you know these lakes you know on their day you know are really prolific you can have one after another but when it's hard like it is now you know you really have to work it and then once you do you reap the rewards
What a result, get in. And there we have it, look at him for a little bar of gold, absolutely over the moon with this one. Caught on that solid bag presentation, had three tied up, ready to go, found the fish, felt the drop, knew I was fishing effectively, and had him straight away. So let's slip him back and see if we can get another one. I've only just slipped that fish back and uh, as, as he swam out of the sling, the rod's ripped off, well, the other rod down the other side of the, the swim. So I think it's clear that the fish are down here. So uh, let's try and get this one. And this one is moving a lot slower than the other one. Um, and when we got in here, I did see a very good fish show really close in, but we'll see. A little bit more. Yes. Well, I wasn't expecting that, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> and how about that then for proof in the pudding? As you can see, it's definitely had the pudding. 22 pounds and 10 ounces. I'm absolutely made up. And I know I keep repeating myself, but it just goes to show that location is key. You know, we've been sat around there for five or so hours with no action at all move around here and had two fish within quick succession. Absolutely made up. I'm so happy, what a beautiful fish, so let's get it back. Here we have it, we're in again. On that left hand rod and again, it almost took the rod in, but uh, this one took a little bit longer. You know, as soon as we've had a few fish, obviously a bit of disturbance, the fish stopped showing. So I kept it quiet again, you know, a couple of rods back out there, slack lines, sat back, and it's not took long, probably about another 10, 20 minutes. So it's, uh, shaking his head really really aggressively now as you can probably see the wind has slightly swung around a bit basically yesterday it was pushing up to that damn wall and obviously the fish got on it but because it's pushing to this bank the fish seem to be scattered all along it and down here like I mentioned before this is a shallower end so obviously with the sun out there enjoying it so let's just get my feet in the water and try and keep him away from the reeds nice gulp of air no. Yeah, here we go. Oh no, he's still got a little bit of fight to him. Oh, I can't lift the net up. There we go. <laughs> what a result. He's a good fish as well too. Brilliant. And there we have it. What a cracker. 22 pounds absolutely made up caught on the same solid bag presentation i've been using throughout the session i haven't yet run through the rig i will do shortly and also the hook baits that are doing the business well i'm sure you're dying to see the bit of trickery that jake's putting inside these pva bags that are working so well i am too because i'm not a solid bag user at all so first of all mate i, I can see straight away the hook link is super super short yep i like a short hook link, mate but that is super short why so short uh, reason being, well, two things. Obviously, you've got to get that into a solid bag, which is, you know, I'm using the extra smalls, for example. So imagine you using a long old hook link, you're going to have to coil it all woven up. up inside. So, right. so one, it's going to be a neat, also for the, you know, the effectiveness of the rig. So if you have a long hook link, they come in on those pellets, they're sucking it in, and obviously if it's long, they've got a lot of movement before they hit the lead. Right. So the whole point of that, with it being short, yep and a light hook bait, as soon as they suck that in, instant contact with the lead. Right, so okay, so it's, it's curled up a little bit like that. Yeah. Boom, it's in and it's tight straight away yep. and they're feeling that inline lead. Straight away. Right, okay. Now you mentioned about the light hook bait as well. Yeah. This is probably something you take for granted that not everyone does. So we've got a piece of floating plastic corn there. Yeah. That's the IB flavour, that one, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. Yep. And then what we've got underneath there, we've got part of a tiger nut, is that? It's, it's a skin tiger nut, but I've, I've been adding liquids to it. So 
I've got a, um, a corn flavour yep. and a, um, a pineapple where what? I've been adding them little and often so, adding a bit, letting them dry out in the sun, adding a bit more so it soaks right in. Right, and they're pretty absorbent tigers, aren't they? They are so. indeed, and even them, like after being out there for the night, you bring them back in, they still smell. You know, right. I've, I always think, you know, tiger nuts on their own are fantastic, but yep. a little something different, you know, to the bloke next door that could be using them. Right. It's a little edge. Okay, cool. And that's going to sit on the bottom. The hook's going to lay flat, I'm assuming. Yeah, and that's pretty much like that. Yeah, yeah. It's just just taking the weight of the hook because the, the whole point with the hook bait is always taking the weight of the hook because when once your bag's dissolved, yep. the fish are coming in. They're seeing that they're greedy and they're yep. going to. What you want is them taking it. You know, as much so when as they, they suck possibly it in, can. You want that to go in first. Just time. to fly straight in. If you've got a you know a 20 mil bottom bait there with a a normal hook and not balanced out at all, they're going to suss it out straight away. And the, you know? the other thing I've noticed from the underwater filming we've done is when the fish are sucking in pellets, they're not using a lot of force, are no, they? No, no. So they're sifting them out and because the pellets are so light, they're moving up really yeah, easily. Yeah. So having something light on the end as well is going to help it go in. Right, okay, and you've got a little sinker on there, just to, I guess just to hold the hook link flat on the bottom. Yeah, yeah that's it. Um, and then let's turn the inline lead around the other way. So. For anyone that's not seen that system with the line on the outside of the lead, explain what that does. Yeah, that's fishing it drop-off style. So in this water, it's really weedy. Yep. So I'm as soon as you're in contact with the fish, you know, it come, brings the fish up in the water once the lead, you know, once comes the lead off. comes off. So if we imitate a take, so that tightens up like that. And, and then bomb, drops off. The lead and is on off. a tight line, it comes up in the water. The fish come up in the water because there's no lead there, and then you've got a far better chance of landing. Yep. Yeah. I'll take it if it's not weedy, or you're getting loads of bites and they're small fish, then you then, don't bother Then there's doing no it. need, you know. Right, right, okay. So it's something to assess, for each angler to assess as and when they fish, yeah. basically. Yeah. Right, okay. So that's your first one. Let's have a look at the second one, because the hook bait's slightly different. Lead system and everything is the same. What, yeah. what ounce lead is that? That's a two ounce. Two ounce in line pair. Yeah. Right, and that's, okay. that's because of the distance I'm fishing, I'm needing to get out there. Um, but, you know, you can fish as heavy as you like, really. Okay. And the hook bait wise, what have you got on the end there? On the end there, I've got half a dumbbell pop up. Yep. Um, soaked in a caramel liquid. Right. And then half of a um, cell dumbbell. Right, okay. So basically, it's going to sit pretty much like that on the bottom. Yep, is it? Same, same again. It takes the weight of it. Right. You know, I've, I've learned from, from watching the underwater footage and even in my own fishing, I've always had a rig to reset itself. Right. But more so after watch, watching the footage. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. I'm, so paranoid about it now and yep. obviously with that supple hook link you can't get it to reset itself like a normal rig you know with the stiffness of the right. hook link now i think it's worth pointing out for people that haven't seen it resetting itself means if the fish sucks it in and doesn't hook itself and yep. blows it out it will come and sit back in a way that means it could hook another fish yeah so it's not going to end up in a massive tangle and because the buoyancy of that bait the hook's obviously heavier and it's always going to end up sitting in the same way as, yeah. as when you first cast it out. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what right. you mean. That's right. right. Okay. And I mean, it's something I put into my fishing all the time as well now. And it's them little things that you're doing, adding that little bit of caramel, changing the buoyancy so it sits just so. I think they're the things that the average guy on here that just comes and fishes and perhaps doesn't catch anything is missing out on. And if yeah. he puts that into his own fishing, it's going to give him more of an advantage. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of fishing is percentages. So, you know, your hook bait, your hook sharpness, finding the fish and putting all these little things together yep. will get you more fish. Well, mate, that's, that's proved entirely in this session because you've had six now? Six, yeah. I've not had a bite yet, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I am a bit out of practice, I will have to say. I haven't yeah. done this fishing for a little while, but it shows you the fine line there is between catching and not. Yeah. And I think if people employ this more into their own fishing, then I think they will catch more fish. And definitely, you will be tying me a few solid bags up <laughs> and I will be using them tomorrow. So uh, that's the guide to rigs inside a solid bag. Those little tiny changes can make a big difference.
Well, what a difference a day makes. Uh, it's our final morning on Braze Nose One. Um, I've already got a fish languishing in the wasteling, which we were just about to photograph. And uh, the same rod is off again. Um, the fish have just must have just turned up on the bait. We obviously left the swim alone for a few hours yesterday while we were up the other end and uh, Jake was successfully extracting those fish from that top corner. And um, as with these sort of places that have got lots and lots and lots of fish in them, if you keep baiting an area, especially if you leave lines out of it for a while, um, the fish will eventually turn up and that's what's happened this morning. Um, I think Jake's got one in the net as well. Gotcha! Wicked. It's a nice carp that is, well pleased with that one. And there he is, 22 pounds 12 ounces. Well chuffed to get this one. And it's nice that the spots have finally started to create a few bites. This is the sort of fishing we were expecting at Bray's Nose, and as we've said, the weather's probably made it a bit moody, but this is the sort of stuff you should be doing when you're coming over here. Spotting very tight, fishing all three rods very close together, and getting them back out there as quickly as you can. So we're gonna get this fella back and show you the other one. And there he is, the first one of the morning, taken just before the crew arrived. Very typical Bray's Nose mid-double, this one. It's going to look stunning when he's bigger as well, I'm sure. And uh, it's nice to get off the mark. I tried really hard yesterday with no result at all. And when that bobbin goes the first time, the old knees were shaking. So uh, we're going to get this one back. And I think Jake's got one a fair bit bigger than this to show you. And there we have it, 27.4, biggest of the session so far. I'm absolutely made up. Caught on those solid bag presentations again. And it's clear that they're finally enjoying the food. So let's slip it back and hopefully have a few more. This is the rig that I'm using in this particular session. Different from what Jake's doing, he's putting everything inside a solid bag, so he needs a very supple hook link. I'm casting it outside of the bag, so I need it to be anti-tangle, so I'm using a coated hook link with like a semi-stiff coating to it. So you can see there, we've got a plastic coating on the outside with a braided core, and the last sort of, I don't know, half an inch is stripped back near the hook, and that's to help it lift up and catch hold in the fish's mouth. And we've seen when we've done underwater filming that when fish are feeding on little items, they feed very, very carefully. And if it's too stiff at the end, it just won't go in their mouth. So you need a little bit of supple there just to help the hook lift and catch hold. And I've got a fair bit stripped back that goes right the way up the hook and up to the hair. I've tied the hook on with a knotless knot and I've made sure that I go through the point side of the hook. It's something I see a lot of people do wrong. They go out the eye side, basically the back of the hook, and that makes the hook flip upwards rather than downwards when the hook link's tightened. So it's actually turning the point away from the flesh rather than towards it. And to further enhance that turning down into their mouth, I've just added a bit of shrink tube on there, carefully shrunk it down and angled it in a little bit, and it just makes the whole thing that little bit more aggressive. And then the hair, before I've tied that, I've put a rig ring onto the hook, and I've gone through that rig ring, which has created a loop, back on itself, and then back on itself again and pulled it tight. It's basically a granny knot and it just secures that rig ring in place. And that also helps everything to turn and catch hold that little bit more aggressively. And this is the bait that I've had a couple of bites on this morning. It's like a fruity squid flavor that I've made up myself. I don't know if you can see there, it's a darker color on the bottom than it is on the top. So that bit's bottom bait mix, that's pop-up mix. And that's gonna help it reset, just like we've been talking about. If the fish blows it out, it will find its way back into that same position so it's ready to get another bite. And that's really important. If it was just a bottom bait, it could end up sitting like that with a hook above it looking really horrible, you know, or tangled up. But if it's got that buoyancy to it on top, then it will always sit round that same way. So let's have a look at some other hook baits to use as well. These little dumbbells are lovely for fishing over this sort of mix. Sometimes you might find that one that matches the, the colour of the pellets when they've been in the water will get you more bites. Other times you might find it's a, it's a bright one that gets more bites. And normally at the start of the session, I'd have three different colours on three rods. Whatever one starts getting the bites, I'd swap everything over to. 
You see the rig there is almost exactly the same. The hair's very, very short. With these slow sinking baits, it's gonna hover just above like that. So you don't want a really long hair. You don't want it half an inch off the bottom looking completely different from everything else. You just want it above the bottom like that with the hook line nice and flat. And then going on to these ones, this is the slow sinking maze. And you can see there we've got a really bright green color there. That's what I'm gonna put on in a minute. I've had the bites on pink this morning, but it's worth changing around with the colours. Sometimes when the light changes, the fish prefer a certain colour. And if that's the case, then I'll swap all rods over to that. And then you might find later on this evening, the white might start doing the bites again. So on prolific lakes like this, it's always worth mucking about with the colour and the flavour of the hook bait because different things work on different days. So what I'm going to do now is wind in the right hand rod. I'm going to swap over to the green, put a fresh stick on and show you the stick mix as well. This is the lead system that I'm coupling the rig with. Again, very simplistic, very, very anti-tangle. I'm fishing a lead clip because it casts extremely well, but I haven't got a swivel inside there. I've got a little quick link for taking the hook link on and off. Now this is gonna turn into a running rig and I'm doing that on purpose because when the fish shakes its head, that will come away. And as the fish moves around trying to get away from the lead, it will just slide further and further down the line away from the fish. We've seen on the underwater filming that a type of running rig like this is very, very effective. Now, you can only fish this on here at the moment because they have treated the water. All the weed has died away, so there's no worry of the lead getting snarled up in the weed. This time a year ago, I would have definitely had a lead clip system on that would dump the lead on the take because it was so weedy here, you needed to lose the lead. But now, open water conditions mean that you can use this one. So I'm going to take the hook link off. It just unclips from that little quick link there. And we're gonna put a PVA stick on our hook link with a green hook bait on. I've got a couple of sticks already tied. It's another important aspect of when you're doing this sort of fishing is to be prepared and have plenty of stuff done. So a needle's just gone through there, lock over the gate latch, and then just pull it back through. You break a little bit of PVA, but that's no problem. And then just pull the hook into the bag like that. So there's no way anything can tangle there. And when that melts, you can have a lovely little pile of attraction with that day glow green bit of maize sitting amongst it. So then we're just gonna hook that back on again. And then we're pretty much ready to go. You can see here it's very hot conditions and stick mixes like this one dry out. If you want to invigorate them, just get some of the water out of your spod mix. Just put a little bit in there, knead it back through it again and it will bring it back to life again. But because it is warm, I'll knock this up fresh every day. It's miles better like that. And it's a very, very simple mix. Just a tin of tuna in oil, then throw some pellets on top of that. Mix those in really thoroughly and then ground bait goes on top of that. And this particular one is a real spicy ground bait the fish absolutely love here that's mixed in as well it will seem a little bit damp to start off with but over probably half an hour to an hour it will soak into the pellets and it will have that sort of consistency like ground bait where it sort of sticks together but it'll break away quite easily and this one this needs invigorating again i need to put a little bit more moisture back in this one just to bring it back to life so one of those on every time i cast out it stops it tangling and gets you a faster bite we'll put that one back out again see if we can catch another fish Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for on Braze Nose One. Uh, it's certainly not been the session we expected it to be. We brought loads of bait with us, thinking we're gonna be sitting in one swim and spotting and spotting and getting loads of takes. The weather's changed all that and very well done to Jake. He's fished outside his own skin over the last few days, moving around the lake, catching fish from close in to a long way out. All credit to him. The way he fishes PVA bags is an absolute art form and I'm certainly gonna put that into my fishing in the future. But I think the thing I've got from it most is the fact that the effort he puts into it, he's just mammoth. You know, he's up all day, all night spotting, he's moving around, you know, and that's why these guys catch so many fish. We've seen a lot of guys on here just sitting back and waiting for it to happen. And in these conditions, it just hasn't happened at all. Jake has made it happen. And I'm sure if you put that into your own fishing, you can make it happen as well. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you on the bank sometime.